Thanks to all of you who are tuning in. Early morning in, in North America, well, on the East Coast. I don't want to rub it in, but it's a gorgeous day in Montreal. We had indeed chosen the right week, but I hope it's uh, the weather is great wherever you are. We are delighted to start the day to uh, Hamar Rosengren from Chalmers University and the University of Gothenburg. And uh, I'm just, uh, I hope everything is all right because um, suddenly all the pictures have disappeared or you're on my screen. I oh, know you're all there. So Hamar, if you would take it, please. We're listening to you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, okay, so thanks, Luke. So uh, bonjour, I guess. Um, so thanks a lot for inviting me to the meeting. Uh, and also, a special thanks to the participants who have their camera on, because it's, it's great to see a few faces. That's really helpful. I mean, you, you don't need to do it, all of you, but uh, a few people, it's really nice. Um, so the title I submitted for this was uh, on the Canada Russell identities, but actually it's not quite accurate. So Canada and Russell have lots of identities, and I will basically just speak of one of them. So more accurately on one Canada Russell identity. Uh, and also uh, on the Rogers Ramanujan identities. So to make it a bit more general, I will uh, spend quite a lot of time on uh, just the classical uh, Rogers Ramanujan identities. Uh, by the way, if, if you have any questions during the talk, I, I probably will not see them in the chat. So I mean, just don't be shy, just unmute yourself and ask. So I will start with the Rogers Ramanujan identities. So I, I'm sure many of you have heard this story before, and uh, some of you have even given talks about it. So uh, then you will just hear it one more time. So the Rogers Ramadan identities, uh, it's this pair of uh, very nice identities relating an infinite series and an infinite product. Uh, and here I wrote down the standard notation at the bottom of the slide. So if, if you uh, haven't seen that before, I mean, you just have to uh, quickly make a note of it because I will really use that all the time. Um, so in, in this series, you see Q to some quadratic power and then divided by a Q factorial. Uh, and the result is some completely factored uh, expression. So some um, history of these things. So uh, they were actually contained in the very first famous letter that Ramadujan wrote to Hardy in 1913. So we know that they were early findings of Ramadujan and they uh, I mean, he, he considered them as among his best results at that time because he put them in this letter. Uh, and at that point, nobody could prove them. Romano John didn't have a proof and Hardy couldn't prove them and McMahon couldn't prove them, but he thought they were uh, sufficiently interesting that he put them in his famous book, Combinatorial Analysis. Uh, but then um, sometime later in England, Ramanujan did find, find that. Uh, and Ramanujan's proof is based on this identity. Here you just plug in a power series variable into the series. And that's quite natural because if you remember what the series looked like, uh, by putting this z equal to one and equal to q, you could capture both uh, these uh, left-hand sides together. Uh, and, and quite often in this business, if, if you have an extra variable like that, you, you could work with, for instance, functional equations in this variable. Uh, so I mean th th that's uh, uh, quite a natural idea. Uh, but what was, I mean, Ramadujan's genius was that he could somehow come up with this right hand side. Um, so actually this identity written here, it's not that hard to prove. Uh, and it's also quite easy to see that it implies both uh, Ram Roger Ramadujan identities. But of course, coming up with the right hand side, that's, uh, that, that, that requires some, some skill. Uh, and I should mention that about the same time, uh, Shore find, found these identities and gave two proofs of them. And, and you note that this was during the war when connections between Germany and Britain were not that great. Um, and then uh, something surprising happened that around Ramadus actually found that these identities were not new. They were contained, contained in a paper by Rogers from 1894. Uh, and Rogers was still around at that time. So Rogers and Ramadujan decided to write a joint paper on these identities, and that was published in 1919. Here's what they looked like. So I mean, they have came from quite different backgrounds, but they were still 
similar in some ways. Uh, so Hardy comments on this. So this, this is what Hardy writes about Rogers. Uh, his gifts were on a small scale, not unlike Ramanujan's own, but no one paid much attention to his work and this particular paper. So that's the paper containing the Rogers Ramanujan identities uh, that was quite neglected. It's interesting, well, they, they are not just some pretty formulas. Uh, they have some connections to other fields of mathematics. And in particular, they are related to combinatorics, to the theory of partitions, uh, well, or, or to number theory, if you like, and also to algebra. There's some, uh, as I will mention later, there's some connection to F and Lie algebras. I want to go through this uh, combinatorics uh, connection uh, quite carefully for the first of these two identities. Uh, so I said that the first Rogers Ramanujan identity has the following combinatorial formulation. Um, so let A of N be the number of partitions of N into parts that are congruent to one or four mod five. So if, if you don't understand immediately what that means, I, I will soon give an example that should make it quite clear. Uh, and B, that's the number of partitions of the same number without repeated or consecutive parts. Um, then those two uh, numbers are the same, so that those two classes of partitions are equinumerous. Um, and the second identity has a very similar interpretation that uh, I will not go into. Um, so let, let's just make an example so, to see that we understand this. So for instance, there's 11 partitions of six, 11 ways to write six as a sum of positive integers if you disregard the ordering. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I didn't have the energy to write down all 11, but I wrote down uh, some of them. Uh, and if you count, you see that three of them have all parts congruent to one or four mod five. So in this case, it means you, you're only allowed to use one, four, and six as parts of the partitions. Uh, then that's just three ways. And three of them lack repeated or consecutive parts. So for instance, three plus three is not allowed because the part three is repeated. Uh, and this one is not allowed because two and one are consecutive and also uh, the one is repeated. Um, so that's just three partitions that uh, satisfy this condition. So we see that in this particular case of uh, the Rogers Romanus identity is true. Let me explain this work. So uh, the product side, it's easiest to, to start with the product side. Um, so this is the right hand side of the first Rogers Romanus identity. Uh, so just write it out, this is what it is. It's this infinite product where um, components of Q here, that's exactly the integers uh, congruent to one or four mod five. And then you want to expand this as a power series. So you just expand each factor here as a geometric series. So you have a, um, an infinite product of uh, geometric series. And then you imagine multiplying all this together. Um, then the coefficient of Q to the N here that, that, that's the number of ways to write n as a sum of a couple of ones, a couple of fours, a couple of sixes, and so on. Uh, and by definition, that's just this number a of n that we're looking for. Uh, so to make it even more concrete, uh, the partition six is one plus one plus four that we had before. So six is two ones and a four. Uh, you could think that, that that comes from choosing q to the two here. So you take two ones, uh, you, take, you choose q to the four here for the one four, and then you just take a, a lot of ones because you, you, you don't choose any sixes or nines and so on. So that, that side is quite, um, and the sum side is a little bit more tricky. Uh, so now, now I start from the partitions. So I, I consider partitions without repeated and consecutive parts. And let's just say for the sake of argument that it has exactly three parts. Well, the smallest part, that's at least one, because by part here, I mean non-zero part. Uh, and the second smallest part, that's at least three, because if it were one, then we would have uh, always a repeated part. It would be equal to the smallest part one. If it were two, then, I mean, the smallest part could be one or two, so we would have, have either consecutive or repeated parts. Um, so the middle part here, it's at least three, and for the same reason, the largest part is at least five. Um, so that's like so, some, um, so some things in these partitions uh, are fixed. Uh, so here, uh, create the partition by this Young diagram. So this is an illustration of the partition eight plus five plus three, right? And I put crosses for these things that you're um, 
you need to have uh, and bullets for these boxes that you're allowed to add at will. Uh, and the point is here that if you take just these bullets and shift them like this, th then you get the di a diagram of another partition. Because say if, if I put two bullets in the bottom row, then I can't put zero bullet bullets in the middle row, because then I would have a repeated part. I can't put one because then I would have a consecutive part. So I have to put at least two. Uh, so th this means that the, these, these rows will be ordered decreasingly as you go down. <clears throat> so th this is another partition. Uh, and it has, in this case, at most three parts. Uh, it could have fewer parts if you don't put anything in the bottom row. And then the next little trick you do is that you I reflect this diagram in the diagonal. Uh, then I get, so I mean, the rows and columns are swapped. So instead of a partition where the largest part is at most three, so at most um, three columns, I get the partition. Uh, what did I say? Yeah, instead of a partition with at most three parts, I get the partition where the largest part is at most three. So I'm just using ones, twos, and threes as parts of my partition. So then uh, in picture, I have decomposed this partition. I started with into this fixed shape and then an arbitrary partition into one, twos, and threes. And in terms of the generating function, of course, the fixed shape that, that just um, has the generating function q to the nine. So it, it counts these nine fixed boxes. Uh, and by the same argument as before, the generating function of this last thing, that's one over one minus q, one minus q square and one minus q to the cube. You're just using ones, twos, and threes in the pair. Uh, okay, so now, now I did it just for three parts, but if you have k parts, you would get in the same way q to the k square, uh, because the sum of the k smallest odd integers, that's k square. And you would get the q factorial uh, for the second factor here. Uh, and then if I want to forget about the number of parts precisely, then I should just sum this up over k. So I get that, the, and, and then you recognize the sum side of the first Rogers Ramanujan identity. Um, so that, that will be the generating function for those numbers that I denoted. So just to summarize, um, so I, I said that the, the product side of this identity, that's the generating function for the partition with these congruence conditions on the parts. Um, the sum side is the generating function for the partitions where you don't have repeated or consecutive parts. So the, the fact that these, I mean, the identity says that the sum and product side are the same. So that means that the numbers a n and b n also have to be the same. Um, so the, these, these two statements here, uh, they are completely equivalent. Okay. Um, so th that was some very classical things uh, that I'm sure many of you heard before. Uh, now I want to come to the Canada Russell identities. So here's a quotation from um, the, the main paper uh, that's relevant here by Canada and Russell. So they, they talk about the um, of F and Lie algebras. And they say that representations of any F and Lie algebra at any positive integral level. So the, the level that's just uh, the eigenvalue of some central element in the algebra. It's, it's not so important right now. Anything like that lead to some sort of identities in volume partitions with a caveat that such identities are generically extremely complicated. Uh, nonetheless, F and D algebras are a treasure trove of many interesting and as yet unknown integer partition identities. Um, so I, I think, I mean, what, what they're saying is that in, in their paper, they just, even if they do a lot, they, they are still just kind of scraping the surface of this, um, what, what's hidden inside F and D algebras. So where, where, where does this connection to F and D algebras come from? Well, oh, here's pictures of Canada uh, and Russell. Um, Russell, uh, a bit blurry, but um, that's how they look. Um, well, I, I will not go into this Lie algebras as all, at all, but um, just historically, it came from a paper by the Pauski and Milne, where they interpreted the Rogers Romanitan identities in terms of level three modules uh, of the F and Lie algebra connected to this F and root system A11. Okay, so F and Lie algebras, they are described by something called F and root systems, and, and this is the absolutely simplest F and root system you could imagine. And then that's a big step from giving an algebraic interpretation to giving an algebraic proof. But Lepowski and Wilson could uh, 
somehow use this and they use a lot of machinery with vertex operators and so on uh, to give a purely algebraic proof of the Rogers and identities. Um, and there's been a lot of work uh, on connections between, I mean, uh, FLE algebra and Rogers and type identities that I will not serve here. Um, but I, I just mentioned that what Canada and Russell actually did was that they considered level two modules of the A92 algebra. Um, so it's a much more complicated affine D algebra, but I think you could say in some sense a, li a little bit simpler class of modules for that algebra. Um, and using that, uh, they were able to find a lot of conjectured Grodis Romanovich and type identities. Uh, but they, they don't give algebraic proofs, at least, so they, they were still conjectures. Um, and then, then they also did, I mean, this, this gives some clues about uh, the shape of these identities. Then they also made some computer search, tried, tried to vary the parameters in their conjectures and, and found even more conjectures that uh, were not directly related to the algebras. And the examples that I, I'm interested in here are, uh, well, there's many conjectures, but I, I'm just talking about nine of them. Uh, so nine of these conjectures give product formulas for special values of these three variable functions. So you see it, it's a triple series, but otherwise it's kind of, it's very Rogers around it and type thing. So in the denominator, you just have Q factorials, uh, but in three different bases here, Q, Q to the four and Q to the six. Uh, and in the denominator, you have this, uh, sorry, numerator, you have this Q to the quadratic power. And then you have these three power series variables to play. And what I want to focus on now, as I said, I will just look at one of them. So one of these nine is the evaluation of F of Q cube, Q to the five, Q to the 12. Um, so that, that should have some nice uh, explicit product form that has to do with the modulus 12. Uh, and I should say that this, this is one of those identities that I found by some computer search. So it's not, uh, at least yet, uh, directly related to Lie algebras. Uh, but it does have a combinatorial interpretation that um, it's a bit complicated, but it fits my slide. So I want to show you that. So this identity, um, just as the one, the Rogers Ramanujan ones, can be interpreted as saying that two classes of partitions are equinumerous. Uh, and the A's here, they come from the product side. And that you can just read off. I already told you how to do that, that uh, the product side, side counts the number of partitions of N into parts congruent to three, four, five, seven, and 11, mod 12. Um, the sum side is a bit tricky. I, I think it, it's too tricky for me, but Canada and Russell could work something out. So they say that the sum side generates the number of partitions of N that, let's say they avoid some patterns. So now, now I imagine I, I write the parts of the partitions as, as a long list of integers in increasing order. Um, and then I can say that inside this list, I, I don't want to see the pattern JJ. Um, so that just means that there's no repeated parts. If J is a part, then J is not a part like another time. Um, and I don't, I don't want to see this pattern. So that means if uh, there could be consecutive parts, but they are not allowed to have the smallest part even. And then there's some even more complicated things. So you, ca you can't have three consecutive even numbers as parts. Uh, if you do have, now I lost the point, sorry, um, here it is. If you do have two consecutive parts, then you can't have the next bigger even number and you can't have the next smaller order number. And finally, you're not allowed to use one and two as parts at all. Um, so three is the smallest part that you can have. Um, and of course, it, it, it's a bit messy, but um, it's really the same kind of statement as for the Rogers Romano that is that you have, you have one conditions on the, one congruence uh, condition for the parts and one set of conditions that basically means that uh, the parts can't be too close to each other. They have to be a bit spread out somehow, according to some rules. Uh, and there's no obvious reasons why, why these two things should have anything to do with each other. But I mean, that, that's, that's what the identities tells you that um, they are exactly the same in number. Okay. So I mean, many of the other uh, Knader-Russell conjectures have a similar kind of 
a, a bit messy, but still combinatorial interpretations. Um, so what's this known about then? Well, uh, Malberg, Bringman, and Jennings Schaeffer, uh, they could prove five of these nine conjectures that I mentioned. And they also proved some further conjectures that I didn't mention. But actually, um, to me, the starting point of this was the last opta um, in Hagenberg. Um, so it's, it's quite nice to be back here at the next one and say something about it. So if you were there, you, you maybe remember this crocodile that uh, apparently had escaped from some circus and that then it had lived in the moat uh, of this small town that we visited for some time. Um, okay, but more relevant to this talk is that um, Jennings Schaeffer was there and I, I went to his talk and I was really intrigued by that. So I, I actually have seen some of those papers before, but it was not until I heard the talk that I got really interested in it and I kind of immediately dropped everything else and uh, started thinking about that. Um, and and uh, after some time, I found what I would say is a more streamlined approach that uh, proves actually all these nine identities, um, including these four that were new. And what's nice is that the four new cases use Askew Wilson polynomials. Um, the five that were known before, uh, they are easier, that they don't need any orthogonal polynomial. What I want to do is to sketch um, one of these proofs uh, where they are all quite similar, but, but the proof of the one identity that I hi highlighted here. So here's the identity again. So th th this is the thing we want to prove, that this big triple sum has a nice product form. Uh, and there's four steps in the proof, basically. First, we represent this triple sum as a contour integral. Uh, then we compute this integral, in a sense, as a single sum uh, of type 2 phi 1. And then we identify this 2 phi 1 as a generating function for Askew Wilson polynomials. I find that we need to use some quadratic transformation that relates, relates Askew Wilson and Rogers polynomials. And using that, we can eventually compute the generating function, which um, eventually computes this triple series. Um, so that's the strategy, and I will uh, give some details about all these four steps. Uh, not too much details, but uh, some details. Um, so the integral re representation I talked about is this thing. So I claim that this triple series is given by this uh, simple single contour integral. And here you should just integrate over some contour that, that separates zero from the poles of the integral. I think if you just look at this, it's clear how to prove that because you want to expand this as a power series in u, v, and w. Uh, and you see you, you have these factors here involving u, v, and w. And actually, Euler knew how to uh, expand those in power series. So you, you just use this formulas of Euler. And then after that, the integration will pick out the constant term in the, the Laurent series. So you also need to expand this extra fact we have in the numerator as a Laurent series. Uh, but Jacobi knew how to do that. That's just uh, Jacobi's triple product identity. Um, so you use Jacobi's triple product, product identity. And then, I mean, that, that's exactly where this extra quadratic uh, factor comes from. Um, so the, the, the proof of this, I would say, is uh, very easy. But then, then, then the question is, what, what can we do with this? Um, contour integral. Uh, well, I, I, need to know, you need, I, I need to use something about uh, this Q analog of Gauss hypergeometric function that I didn't know before. So the, the, this is the definition of the 2 phi 1 function. And I need to use some integral representation for of this thing. Uh, and that seems to be new. I haven't seen it anywhere. So I mean, if, if you look in the book by Gaspar and Rachman, you, you find lots of, I mean, vaguely similar integrals. but I couldn't find exactly this one there. Uh, anyway, um, that's what you need to use. And where does this come from? Well, I mean, it, it, it's tempting to try to use residue calculus to compute the integral, but uh, here you see that the, the structure of the residues here is quite complicated. They, they form three um, kind of infinite um, progressions. Do is something a bit strange. I, I introduce an extra effect to here in the integral. I just plug in this extra factor. And then I create uh, another sequence of residues 
And then what I do is that I um, expand the input as a sum of uh, the residues at those extra points. Um, and then uh, it's easy to compute this. You see that it's, uh, it becomes a 3 phi 2 series. I mean, that, that basically is in the Gaspar Rachman book. Uh, and then at 3 phi 2, that's quite nice. You can apply some transformation formulas. And the in that, after doing that, you can actually let d tend to 0. And then in the limit, you will get rid of this extra fact that you introduced. And the 3 phi 2 will reduce to a 2 phi 1. So that's, that, that's how I prove this integral representation. And um, comparing these two integral representations, you, you see that, that there are some cases when uh, this integral I have here for the f actually agrees with the integral I have here for the 2 phi 1. You, you can choose the parameters in, in actually various different ways and, and achieve this. Uh, and it happens for those special values that I wanted to consider. I wanted to take the variables of u, v, w to be these particular numbers. And then that integral turns out to be one of those integrals that also represent the 2 phi 1. Uh, and it's exactly this 2 phi 1, um, where omega here is a cubic root of unity. Uh, so then I want to compute the left hand side. So I, I could as well try to compute the right hand side, right? Um, so the conjecture is reduced to a 2 phi 1 evaluation. Um, you have to prove this thing. But I mean, the, the, these were the kind of things that uh, Chris showed in his talk last meeting, and, and that was very kind of so, somehow provocative to me. I mean, I mean, if, if you have something like this, I mean, sh surely it has to be known, or it has to be like very close to some known results or so. Uh, but it seems that this is not the case, really. I mean, this um, you you can't find this in uh, the textbooks. Um, so it, it's a very unusual evaluation of that. So, so somehow you have to prove the way to do that, that, that that's where orthogonal polynomials somehow come to the rescue. So Rodius strikes again. So now, now, now I see Murad both in the audience and on, on the screen. That's nice. So uh, uh, Dick and Murad in this pa the paper, they um, write about Rodius' work like this, that they say that the, so I mean, the, the Rodius from algebra identities, they, they, they are contained in a series of three papers. And those papers contain a lot, they contain a lot more than just those identities. And in particular, they say that the, the polynomials in the third paper are probably more interesting and important than any other results in Rogers' papers, including the Rogers Ramanujan identities. So that's maybe, maybe they wrote like that to, to, to provoke someone in a friendly way, I don't know. But um, I, I think there's a good case for this. I mean, I think the Rogers Romanian identities, they have been used a lot as inspiration uh, for doing other things. But um, the orthogonal polynomials, I mean, they have really been used. I mean, they are, they are used like on a daily basis by people doing all, all kinds of mathematics and physics and so on. Um, so in, in that sense, I think I would agree that Rogers polynomials are more interesting and important uh, than the Rogers Romanian identities even though, of course, it, it, they are both uh, very interesting and important. Um, so what are those polynomials? Well, uh, so the, the, this is in the notation of uh, Ask and Ismail, which is now standard. So Rogers introduced the Rogers polynomials, also called the continuous Q ultraspherical polynomials. So they are some polynomials depending on Q and on an additional parameter. And they can be defined for instance, through this generating function, if you expand this in as a power series of t, then the coefficient of t to the n is a polynomial in cosine theta of degree n, and that's this polynomial. Um, and what Rogers didn't realize is that these are actually orthogonal polynomials. Um, so Ask and Ismail proved that they are orthogonal with respect to this explicit orthogonality measure. Um, so of course, the, I mean, the, the, the constant in the orthogonality is known, but it's not important right now. And then S, yes, and Wilson, as a lot of you know, know introduced some more general polynomials. Um, so the S, and Wilson polynomials, they have four additional parameters and they are given by this, um, well, four parameter, four plus Q parameter orthogonality measure. Actually, all I want to, 
what I need about these polynomials right now is the generating function that, well, Ismail and Wilson, so the, 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 the last two element subset here of these three people, um, they found this generating function for the ASCII Wilson polynomial. So it's actually not quite apparent if you look at this, but if you expand this as a power series, again, the coefficients will be polynomials in cosine theta, and they are the ASCII Wilson polynomials. And then, um, as I said, the, the, the ASCII Wilson orthogonality measure, that, that's more general than the Rogers one, or, or, or better, the ASCII Ismail one. And there's actually at least three, there's at least three essentially distinct way that the ASCII Wilson polynomials reduce to the Rogers polynomials. Um, and one of them is the following, that if you choose the ASCII Wilson parameters as a minus a square root of q minus square root of q, then you can check that the ASCII Wilson measure in base q becomes this ASCII Ismail measure in base q square. Uh, and then if, if the measures are the same, the, the polynomials have to be the same up to some normalization that we can compute. Um, so ASCII Wilson polynomials in base q are Rogers polynomials in base q square. So that's a quadratic transformation. Uh, and then, of course, you could use the generating function for the guys on the right here and, and view them as a generating function for Rogers polynomials. Um, so let's call that the second generating function. So um, the, the generating function for Rogers polynomials that uh, comes from this relation. So be, before I had two, two, five, one series, but one of them is summable actually. So you just have one, two, five, one, and that's a generating function for uh, the Rogers polynomials. And this you might recognize, it, it's something like this that we want to evaluate. And we have a cubic root of unit here, so we want to take the theta to be two pi over three, right? Uh, and if you flip back a few slides, you see that the a here should be q to the three quarters. Um, so I, I want to evaluate this two five one or equivalent this generating function as some, as some very special value of the variable and the parameter. Uh, and how to do that? Well, well, there's something special about Rogers polynomials at this value two pi over three. Um, that's a very nice formula for them that, well, I, I haven't seen that uh, either before, but th that's actually quite easy. That's, this, this formula is an immediate consequence of uh, the, the formula I gave as a definition that just the first generating function. Um, so what I do then is that I just plug this formula into the second generating function. Uh, and then, th then you just change the order of summation. You see that you, you need to apply the Q Gauss summation. You need to apply the Q Gauss summation another time. And, and then you compute your sum. Um, so I, I didn't write down this in detail because it's completely straightforward. Uh, but th that, that will prove you the, this uh, Canada Russell conjecture for. Uh, for these particular values of the, yeah. Uh, so I, I have plenty of time, so I, I thought I would just uh, flash some other things about you. So I, I know Madam, you like identities. So let me show you some other things that uh, I found, um, like a byproduct. So uh, I mean, usually um, summation should be special cases of transformations, right? Um, so the summation sum I showed you that can be easily upgraded with exactly the same proof to a transformation formula. And what's interesting is that that's a sextic formula. So it relates uh, a two phi one in base Q to a three phi two in base Q to the six. Uh, and sextic transformations, they are quite unusual. I, I don't think there are many examples of that. Um, so there, I mean, then, if you specialize A's in uh, some special ways, then this three phi two becomes summable and, and one of those summations is um, the, the one that was interesting here. Um, and I can also do some variations of this proof and find other things that uh, were not conjectured by Canada Russell but are kind of similar like th this is my favorite one because the right hand side is so nice. So the right hand side is just this very simple product of Q uh, factorials which count partitions into parts not divisible by six. Um, but the left-hand side is a bit messy, messy because you have 
minus q here so that there would be some uh, sign changes and stuff. So I, I, I don't know how to give a combinatorial interpretation for the left hand side, but uh, maybe someone who is good, good at these kind of games could, could still somehow re rewrite it somehow and work with this. Uh, what else? Well, well, I said that that all those nine cannot rust conjectures for uh, the function f can be proved by, I mean, basically the same kind of tricks. Um, the five cases that were known before, they're essentially easier because uh, you don't need this orthogonal polynomials business. Um, the other three cases are, I mean, they, they are just a little bit trickier because, I mean, the, the parameters are a bit off, so you have to combine this with some contiguity relation, doing some kind of standard tricks like that. Um, but what, what I showed you was the simplest uh, new case. Well, that, that was new before. And there's also some recent papers um, on this. I, I saw that actually that uh, Jim McLaughlin gave a talk about this yesterday that I um, unfortunately couldn't attend. So uh, I, I can't tell you to go to his talk because it, it, it was already yesterday, but maybe some of you were there. Uh, and there's also two recent preprints by Wang and Wang uh, with a co-author uh, on the archive where they I mean, they basically use this kind of approach to find more Rogers Romanovich and type identities. Uh, but I should say, I mean, I really want to stress here that this is not like some uh, universal tool. Uh, there's lots and lots of Rogers Romanovich and type identities in the literature. And I'm quite sure that most of them are quite beyond the scope of this method. Um, and in particular, I want to stress that Canada and Russell have still further conjectures that are still open, that nobody knows how to prove so that there's still uh, work to be done here. So I'm, I'm, I will finish in quite a good time, but we have, we have time for questions at the end. Um, so I, I just want to say that um, if you're interested, this paper is to appear in the Ramadan Journal, and of course, it's also in the archive. Uh, and it's dedicated to the memory of Dick Eske, just like this whole conference. And I. Well, I, I really miss Dick. So if, if he were here, he would wake up uh, at this point and uh, make some very, <laughs> so, 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 some very deep and relevant comments on. That's all I want to say. So I mean, th thanks for your attention. Thank uh, you very much, Almar. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Very, it was a very nice talk, and we have much time, ample time for questions. So are there any or comments? Murad, you, you should uh, act like Dick. Yeah, but I, I saw that Murad was awake, so uh, you're <laughs> yes, muted, Murad. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me ask a, a question then, Luke. So a very vague question, of course. Uh, very nice talk, Yalmar. And if, of course, it seems to me like somebody who's not really into these uh, stuff um, of, of partitions and the Rogers Ramanujan identities. So it's, it seems uh, that, that it is some kind of uh, coincidence how you can make all these steps. So what I would like to ask you is, how do you see these steps appearing? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, what I did was I just tried everything and not, nothing worked. And then, I mean, I, I just had the idea that, I mean, I, I, I just used everything I, I knew about the 251 and this, this was the last thing I did. So I, I, I didn't have like some clever idea behind it. So, uh, so but I mean, it's a good question. I mean, that, does this point to the, I mean, maybe maybe if you want to do things like this for general F and Lie algebras, which is apparently very hard, then I mean, maybe orthogonal polynomials are useful or so, or maybe this is just some weird coincidence that happens for this particular F and Lie algebra. I, I have no idea. Uh, which because one there's is. still many, many more F and Lie algebras around, so you could explain. Yeah, yeah, of course, there's infinitely many. <laughs> yeah. Your method was not somehow motivated or uh, by, by these uh, affine Lie algebra uh, uh, No, not at all, um, no. Well, I find that quite amazing. Yeah. I, I had uh, maybe an even more na naive uh, question, Hama. You know, do you have some insight, you know, in, in the combinatorial explanation as to why these numbers, you know, what, why the structure, one, three, five, seven, eleven. What? Why? Where? Any light on on the special type of combinatorial problems that are picked by those uh, identities? 
Yeah, I mean, but by now there's lots of these things. And I mean, there's lots of different product sites where you can write down some, some register management type identities, but- um... Yeah, but you cannot pick any type of, you know, there's some structure in, in the combinatorial, uh, you know, element. So is there something, again, I know it's, uh, but it, it, it's related to, uh, you know, uh, Katz Moody uh, algebra representation, but why A39 and, you know? Uh... Yeah, yeah. And I mean, actually, I mean, the one I showed you what isn't really related to the F and the algebras, but I mean, I mean, yeah. sometimes you, you, you could take these character formulas for F and the algebras, and, and you see, like, if you, if you specialize the variables there in some way, you, you will get the, these kind of things that count partitions. So, yeah. Um, I guess I'm looking for some kind of a uniformity or genericity in, in these uh, in these identities, but uh, yeah. that's the miracle of them, right? Uh, yeah. Howard Howard Cole Howard Cole has a question. Howard, hey, how, hey Omar. Yeah, um, hi. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, during your talk, I think you said that um, there's at least three ways to represent the Rogers polynomials in terms of S. D. Wilson polynomials. I know, yeah. I know two. But I, I I didn't know about a third. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, I, I can because I mean here here we're changing q here to q square on the left, but you, you could also do it with q on both sides, so or you could do it with q on the left and q square on the right. Uh, and for the last one, I guess you have to take something like maybe a a q, or I guess a a a square root of q b b square root of q or so. Are, you you, are you, somehow, you you want these factors to combine into stuff that have to do with the square root of q. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think uh, I, I don't remember if they are there, but uh, I mean, I, I can send you something like that later. Oh, but, that would be great. Thanks yeah, a lot. yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I can explain what it is. Hey, uh, Michael. Uh, yes, uh, there was a sextic identity. Uh, did, uh, did you find that and or was that known and how did you find it? Uh, no, I, I found it, and it came from the proof. So I mean, the, in the proof, I said I, I specialized a to q to the three quarters and theta to two pi over three. Okay. So if you only specialize theta and keep a general, then uh, you just do the same thing, and this is what pops out. I see. Um, so it, it, it's just um, something you get with exactly the same proof. So it, it, you, you get it for free. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. No, but the, the, this uh, wasn't known. No. Well, Hjalmar, just one follow-up question. So does that mean there's three representations for the al salam Chihara as well? Uh, uh, no, I don't think so, because then you have kind of less, then you have less freedom to play with this, this uh, weight function. There's a relation between continuous Q ultra spherical and, and al salam Chihara. They are not the same polynomials, right? No, so I, I think you, you really need uh, you, you need somehow to play, play with all these four factors to get these kind of three, yeah, th three, three different things happening. Okay. Yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah I, I, can I ask a question? Will yes, please. Uh, there must be something special about cubic roots of unity. Uh, did you try any other uh, roots? Not really. I mean, you, you see also in this generating function that if you specialize to a cubic root of unit, then, but then I mean, these, these things kind of combine in some nice way. You, you could write this as something with Q cube and something with Q. If, if you take like a quintic root of unit, it will already become messier. So um, I didn't try that, but uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, okay, I don't see any more. So Hamar, thank you very much. Thank you for the talk and, and answering the questions.